this mic. Uh, uh, it, it's, uh, it's likely that uh, a number of you will be leaving during the afternoon. So I thought this might be a good time to thank the organizers for this wonderful conference and uh, uh, show them our appreciation while there are still many of us here. Two years, right? <coughs> yeah. A couple of years. A couple might be two or three. Okay. Um, de de December would be nice. Uh, just. Are you sure you want to come here in the summer? Oh, okay. Well, you 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 pick the time. But, uh, okay. All right. So our, our uh, first. Speaker this session is Micah Milinovic, uh, and he's going to speak on Fourier analysis and the zeros of the Riemann zeta function. Okay, thank you, Steve. And uh, thanks again to the organizers for the conference and allowing me the chance to speak. Um, right, so uh, um, at the beginning of the talk, I'm going to talk about joint work with Emmanuel Carniero, who's um, in the front here and uh, locally at IMPA, and Vor Panchandi, who's uh, now in Thailand. Towards the end of the talk, I'll, talk, I'll um, refer to some results on pair correlation, and that's joint with these two, and also Friedrich Lippmann, who's at North Dakota State. So I want to talk about um, some extremal problems that arise when you study the zeros of the Riemann zeta function. So I guess if you were here at the school last week, you saw a lot about the zeros of the zeta function. Uh, let me just remind you, uh, zeta function, uh, right? So you write it as a sum 1 over n to the s, or it has an Euler product. Uh, 1 minus 1 over p to the s inverse. Uh, it continues um, to the entire complex plane apart from a simple pole at s equals 1. There's a functional equation that relates s to 1 minus s. Uh, that gives zeros on the real axis at the negative even integers. And there's an infinite number of complex zeros in the critical strip uh, between uh, 0 and 1. Uh, there's another symmetry of the zeros that they're symmetric about uh, the real axis, so the number above the real axis is the same as the number below. And uh, Riemann's hypothesis is that all the zeros are on the line, uh, real s equals a half, that's the, the line of symmetry from the functional equation. So I'm going through this a little quickly because we've seen it a number of times over the last two weeks. Um, uh, sort of the tool I'm going to be talking about most today is the explicit formula, so let me remind you kind of briefly where that comes from. So if you uh, start with the Euler product and you logarithmically differentiate, uh, you get back to a Dirichlet series that's now supported on prime powers. So you get, uh, this is von Mangold's function, you get log p if n is a prime power and you get zero otherwise. And uh, from here, through various uh, either Mellon transform identities or complex integration, you can get uh, what are known as explicit formula. So uh, the one that's usually proved in a first course in analytic number theory is the riemann van mangold explicit formula. So assume x is not an integer, so we'll eliminate the condition that was in Bruce's talk. Um, so if you sum n less than x, uh, this comes from the pole of the zeta function. You get an x contribution. This is a sum over the non-trivial zeros of the zeta function, you get x to the row over row. This is essentially a sum over the trivial zeros, but it, it becomes a logarithm. And as x gets big, this is tending to 0. And then this is uh, sort of a residue that comes from the, the weight you're integrating against. And so the point is you can get a hold of the sums over primes and prime powers. You can write it as, well, this is what we expect this sum to be. And then there's something, the zeta zeros appear. And it's explicit in the sense that we can relate uh, the behavior of the primes explicitly to the behavior of the zeros. So um, the prime number theorem was proved from a truncated version of this. So you can prove a version of this where the, the zeros are cut off at some point. And then the whole point is to show that this uh, sum is less than this value. So you need that the real part of the zeros are strictly less than 1. And that's the, how the prime number theorem was originally proved. So uh, I'm going to reverse the process. So there's many versions of the explicit formula. I'll show you uh, the one that I'm going to use in a moment. Um, and I want to reverse the process and uh, study the zeros of the Riemann zeta function and later other L functions, um, sort of using what we know about the primes. So, um, so it's explicit, but going the other direction. Um, and so we've been trying to do this in an optimal way 
uh, using sort of natural constraints that arise from the number theory end, and then sort of trying on the Fourier analysis end to construct functions that meet those criteria in sort of some sort of optimal way. I'll try to make this a little more clear in a moment. So if we want to study zero, zeros, um, let me remind you roughly what we know about them. Oh, so first, no, okay, first I guess here's the explicit formula in a more general way uh, due to, um, I guess, Guinan for the zeta function and ve in general for other L functions. So here, uh, rho equals half plus i gamma are the zeros of the zeta function. Um, so if Rh is true, gamma is real, otherwise gamma could be a complex number with real part less than a half. Um, and so here's the way that I like to think about this. So this is some nice function. I'll tell you what nice means in a moment. And this gamma prime over gamma factor is the density of zeros. So if the zeros were uniformly distributed, this would be a Riemann sum approximation to this integral. Um, but we know uh, that the zeros of the Riemann zeta function are not uniformly distributed. They conjecturally have this GUE distribution. This is the Montgomery Dyson conjecture. And so this is the arithmetic correction that tells you sort of how far away from approximating uh, this integral is this sum. And so here's where arithmetic enters. Um, so here gamma uh, R of S is just a normalized version of the gamma function that comes from completing zeta. And um, this is the Fourier transform of H uh, normalized in the usual way that we do in number theory. Uh, and nice um, uh, has a whole different bunch of meanings, but for the purposes of this talk, uh, nice is typically going to be analytic in a strip that contains the real axis. And you're going to want uh, the function to decay enough so that this sum converges really nicely and this integral converges really nicely. <coughs> uh, okay. So uh, in his original manuscript, uh, Riemann, um, I don't remember what he said in German. So in English, he said there's roughly this many zeros up to height t. And he didn't really give any justification for that. Um, so how did he know this? Uh, well, we don't know for sure, but we can speculate. Uh, he probably used the argument principle. So um, if uh, the functional equation in asymmetric form, right, if we complete the zeta function with this gamma factor, it has this nice symmetric form. And if you use the argument principle very carefully, you can prove an exact formula for the number of the zeros. Um, so this one comes from the pole, because remember, the argument principle counts the number of zeros minus number of poles. And uh, it's basically 1 over pi times the argument of this thing, and then 1 over pi times the argument of zeta. Um, and then again, in a first course in analytic number theory, uh, you typically apply Stirling's formula here. Uh, and we know the gamma function very well. In fact, it, this argument is going to be, uh, I guess, infinitely differentiable and continuous. It has. So um, all the mystery is here. So this is a step function that controls the distribution. This is a nice continuous function. So something crazy is going on here. Uh, so I'm going to call that function s of t. And that's what I'm going to study uh, more or less at the beginning of the talk. And as I just said, the mystery of the distribution is really captured in this s of t function. This is a continuous function. This is a step function. So everything that's going on has to be here. Uh, right, so um, uh, zeta function is a built-in function in many computer packages like Mathematica. So you can just go ahead and plot its argument. And here's what uh, that s of t function looks like between 95 and 105. So um, every time you hit a 0 of zeta, it's going to jump by 1, and it's going to decay kind of, well, almost linearly until you hit another zero. Uh, we think all the zeros should be simple, so it should always be jumping by one. Um, I guess notice it's, pr it's pretty small. Even up at height 100, you're at, you don't get bigger than I don't know, 3 quarters or something. You're, I guess you're close to 0.8. If you go um, to an interval of length 10 around 1,000, you can see the zeros are getting more dense because they're growing like t log t. But it's still staying fairly small. Um, now I'm going to go to an integral of length 5 around a million. So it looks about the same dense, but I've cut the length of the interval in half. So they're still getting more dense. So it's getting a little bit more erratic, but it's staying pretty small. And I think if uh, you look back at uh, Lisko's papers where he's describing his computations in the 80s, he never found a value of s of t bigger than 3, and he stated that as an open problem. I think he found things that are slightly bigger than 2. Um, but um, Jonathan Bober and Guy Thierry have found large values of S of t, and they're up around that height. Um, 
But uh, here's this same value zoomed out a little bit. So even though there's a big positive value and a big negative value, it's staying close to 1 everywhere else nearby. OK. Um, but we actually know a lot about this S of t function. Selberg proved a central limit theorem for it. Uh, and so um, well, S of t, if you divide by essentially square root of log log t, uh, converges to a Gaussian. So it's typically behaving about something like this size, right? So if I list go on at a value bigger than 3, if you know S of t is bigger than this, about half the time, right? So you just have to find when this is bigger than 3. So it's somewhere up around 10 to the 826 billion. So OK, I don't think you're going to find it by trial and error. Um, OK, anyway, hopefully I did that calculation correctly. <clears throat> um, OK, so I'm going to focus more on um, how big can S of t get. So the classical result, uh, 1905, von Mangel showed that it's uh, no more than um, big O log t, so constant times log t. So typically, it's square root of log log t. And um, unconditionally, we know it's log t. Littlewood showed um, you can do a little bit better assuming Rh. So you can save a factor of log log. And in fact, the antiderivative, the integral, is uh, even smaller. So uh, I guess my interpretation of this is in order for something this big to be this big, it has to usually be small and change sign a lot to keep the integral small. Because if it stayed positive for a while, that integral would be big occasionally. Um, right, so uh, one of the things my collaborators and I have done recently is, is we've proved um, sort of sharp versions of Littlewood's inequalities. And we have reason to believe that that's sort of the limit you can do without some kind of breakthrough in uh, handling exponential sums over primes. So uh, here's what these theorems look like. So this, again, is joint with Emmanuel Carniero and uh, Vora Panchandi. So we can prove instead of a big O, uh, we get a factor of a quarter, log t over log log t. Um, previous to our work, Goldstein and Gonick had had a half here. So it improved Goldstein and Gonick's result by a factor of two. And for this integral um, of s, uh, instead of big O, we get uh, pi over 48 for the upper bound and minus pi over 24 for a lower bound. Uh, which suggests some negative bias that we don't quite understand yet. Because, um, uh, and let me just remark that uh, you can use this bottom theorem to imply the top one. So I think they're roughly of the equal strength, maybe. Um, right, so uh, basically, uh, these boil down to some sort of extremal problem in Fourier analysis. So you, you use the explicit formula, you use number theory in some way, and you have some constraints, and then you want to solve it in an optimal way. Uh, there is some history of this in analytic number theory. So I guess the motivational papers, um, in Montgomery's original paper on pair correlation, he showed two thirds of the zeros are simple. And then he later reinvestigated this with uh, Taylor in 1974, and was able to get the proportion up to like 67.25% uh, using an extreme, you know, the optimal choice in his theorem. Uh, Gallagher uh, used to study distribution of spacings between zeros. I'll return to this later in the talk. Um, Gall this, this result will reappear. Um, and then we haven't found much in the literature until uh, one level density got popular. And uh, there's a beautiful appendix in a paper of Ivanis Lewis Sarnak where they, um, given the different one level density measures, choose optimal test functions. So the, the measure isn't Lebesgue measure, it's something that arises from a family of L functions. Um, and they're able to replace things like um, 15 over 16 with cotangent of 9 over 4 minus 1 over root 2, kind of crazy expression that improve it a little bit. And then more recently, uh, Goldstein and Gonick studied this S of t function, and Chani and Sundararjan studied uh, log mod zeta. So this is the real part of the logarithm of zeta. This is the imaginary part. Uh, OK, so here's the theorem. I kind of want to indicate to you how to prove. So we, we have four different proofs of this that all lead to the same sort of optimal choice. Uh, and we didn't understand why until very recently. Um, but I'm going to first illustrate to you the simplest proof. Uh, but unfortunately, it's not, it doesn't generalize. So then I'll indicate a pr uh, an idea of one that generalizes to other L functions. So ideally, you'd like something that wasn't special to zeta that, that went to every L function. Uh, OK, so again, here's the explicit formula we're going to use. Sum a test function over the zeros. You get that test function against essentially the density of zeros, and then the sum over primes. So uh, 
this is the simplest proof, which is also our most recent. So uh, we use the fact that the number of zeros of zeta um, from 0 to t is the same as it is from 0 to negative t. So if you plug in the characteristic function of an interval to the sum over zeros, this is counting the number of zeros from minus t to t. That's the same as twice up to t. So if you divide by 2, this is true. So we're using at the start um, that zeta function is self-dual. So this proof isn't going to generalize to L functions in general. It will generalize to self-dual ones. Uh, and I said you can estimate this exactly um, as uh, the argument of this normalized gamma function plus s of t. This is the quantity we want, plus 1. Uh, and then here's maybe where um, we get silly. Uh, we write this as the integral from minus t to t of this, this thing. But that's just using that this is the imaginary part of the logarithm. This is a logarithmic derivative. And then we get a little sillier here. We say that's the characteristic function of the interval times this density. Uh, the point being that we have the same function here and here. This is an infinite sum. This is an infinite integral. It looks like an explicit formula. And uh, this is all equals. So we didn't have to estimate anything yet. Um, OK, so now we want to transfer it to a Fourier analysis problem. So suppose we had a function which is always bigger than the characteristic function of the interval, which just was in our previous slide. And it had uh, Fourier transform is compactly supported. And its Fourier transform is, say, uniformly bounded. Uh, well, then, um, if I sample that function minus the characteristic function of the interval, this is positive. So we can use this sums positive. Uh, here, um, we'll expand it out. You'll get twice n of t. And here, you'll get something you can plug into the explicit formula. Right? OK, so do it and rearrange things. So all we've used so far is that this sum is positive. You get sort of an exact upper bound for s of t. And I haven't made a single estimate yet. Uh, well, OK, I made this one. Um, now, uh, uh, essentially, right, this is um, support, compactly supported. So this sum over primes is finite. We assume this thing is uniformly bounded. So this is something that we can estimate with the prime number theorem. And because of the root n, you'll get essentially half the length of the sum. Uh, and so if such a function exists, you get an inequality that looks like this. And so the point is, uh, given a function, given these constraints, all you have to do is minimize this integral. Um, and that actually turns out to be a problem um, that arose in the 70s, proving the large sieve inequality. And this problem was solved by Selberg. Um, so uh, let me tell you about um, Selberg's functions. So let chi uh, be a characteristic function of an interval AB. Um, so Selberg, uh, based upon earlier work of Berlin, uh, constructed entire functions which satisfied exactly the kind of inequalities we want. They're always bigger than the characteristic function of interval or smaller than characteristic function of interval. And their support is uh, compact, the Fourier transform. Uh, and he went on to show that if uh, the length of the interval is an integer, uh, then among all the entire functions which have these two properties, th these are the minimal in the sense that they minimize this distance. So these are called um, berlin selberg functions by most people. I think Sid Graham calls them the amazing functions, right? But, OK. Um, so uh, two things to notice here um, is uh, one is that uh, the longer I take the support of the Fourier transform, the smaller is this distance. So there's an interplay there. Uh, and that's the kind of thing an analytic number theorist loves. Um, so we can sort of set things up in an optimal way. Another thing to notice is that uh, uh, the length of the interval doesn't appear in this approximation. And this is a, a crucial piece in what we need. Because we want t to be arbitrarily large. We don't want the how well we're approximating to depend on t. Um, so I, I think that's a rather remarkable property, is that um, you get the same approximation no matter what interval you're uh, majorizing. So let me say that um, Selberg's construction works for any length interval, but it's only optimal when uh, the length is an integer. So you get the same value of the integral, uh, but in fact, when it's not an integer, these aren't the optimal choice anymore. Um, OK, so here's what they look like. Uh, I forgot to normalize. So this is really the characteristic function of minus 1, 1. It's not normalized appropriately. So use your imagination to stretch it. Um, so here's what it looks like if you have Fourier transform supported in minus 1, 1. And as I increase the support of the Fourier transform, they get nicer. Um, it's minus 2, 2, minus 5, 5, minus 10, 10. It almost looks right exactly like it's supposed to. I would have gone to minus 100, 100, but you wouldn't 
Okay, I think the behavior is fairly clear. Okay, so just, oh, so if you're curious about these, um, look in Mo Montgomery's article, Analytic Principle of Large Civ, Valor's Extremal Functions in Fourier Analysis, or uh, Volume 2 of Selberg's Collected Work. I think they're also in Tenenbaum's book on probabilistic and analytic number theory. Uh, right. So go back to the inequality we had. So you just plug in Selberg's function here, and he told us exactly what this integral is. Now there's this kind of um, gamma prime over gamma factor, uh, but this is essentially something like log u. So you can just integrate by parts, uh, and it goes away. Right, so um, apart from that gamma factor, this is precisely the Berlin and Selberg we're trying to minimize. Um, so uh, no work had to be done, so you just plug in the answer, and then um, if you're an analytic number theorist, you know what to choose for delta, and it, it kind of all works out. And Selberg has um, lower bounds for the characteristic function, or m minor ends for characteristic function interval, so you can get a lower bound for SFT in the same way. So uh, I told you we had four proofs. This is the fourth one we found. We would have been much happier if this had been the first. Okay. Um, but uh, that's the way things work sometimes. Uh, right. So that proof relied on a crucial way that the non-trivial zeros were symmetric about the real axis. And um, so, right, if you want to generalize to uh, all L functions, well, I mean, in general, the zeros aren't, um, an L function isn't, self-dual, so you might have a different number from 0 to t than from 0 to negative t. And so um, your first instinct might be, well, then just take the characteristic function of the interval 0 to t instead. Um, and that's fine. That'll work in the proof. But uh, the, the issue from the Fourier analysis standpoint is that has two discontinuities of height 1, uh, whereas the function we used was um, 1 half uh, chi from minus, one, uh, minus t to t. That has two discontinuities of size 1 half. So we're guaranteed to do twice as well as a, uh, a interval from uh, to yes, but we didn't realize that until this proof came along. So we didn't understand what was going on with our first improvement of their result. Uh, but I can explain what's like how that relates in a second. But yeah, so I think that's essentially what's going on. So uh, any function you take to approximate S of t has to have a discontinuity of size 1, because you jump by 1 at every 0. Uh, but if you want to do it in an optimal way, you have to choose, um, an, you, you have to choose an approximation that also only has a jump of size 1. So if you have jumps that add up to more than 1, then from a Fourier analysis standpoint, you're going to do worse than what we did here. So. Yeah, I think that's the understanding we have now, and that's why it improves. But we didn't have that understanding until very recently. Um, but OK. Uh, OK, so we wanna, I want to give you another proof for zeta that's better because it generalizes to basically any kind of L function with a functional equation and Euler product. Um, so uh, S of t is the imaginary part of log zeta. So you can write that as an integral of uh, zeta prime over zeta. And we'll just stop at 3 halves with an error of, of big O1. Um, so here you have to assume t is not at a height of a 0. That's an innocent enough assumption. Um, and uh, we have a lot of formulas for these kinds of things. You just open Davenport's book or Tishmarsh book and play around a little bit. Um, so if you plug this into here, um, you're going to get a sum over zeros that doesn't converge nicely. So you have to plug this in and then do a little bit of fiddling. Uh, but if you do that, you can get, um, well, so ignore what this is and just say this is a function of t minus gamma. So, uh, and uh, the, what, uh, you have to fiddle enough so that it decays uh, enough that we can use um, this approximation theory for it. So this decays like 1 over t minus gamma cubed. It's not at all obvious from staring at it. Um, OK, so the point is we can write s of t as a sum over the zeros of the zeta function of something. And don't, don't worry rightfully what it is, but uh, this thing has a discontinuity of size 1, which is exactly what we want. Uh, it jumps by 1 at the origin. Um, uh, but So it's not analytic in a strip. Um, so you can't use um, the explicit formula. You're going to have to find something that's always bigger than this arctangent function or always smaller than it and, and put that in instead. So we play the Berlin-Selberg game. <coughs> 
We want to construct functions that are always bigger or always smaller, and we want them to decay rapidly enough that we can use the explicit formula. Um, and we want uh, the distance between these two to be small in L1 norm, uh, but this f is an odd function, so that's the same as saying the integral of our major and our minor n is small, but that's the same as saying the Fourier transform at zero is small. Um, and the ones we construct, sort of this value just pops out of the construction. Um, uh, and we want the Fourier transforms to be supported in minus delta delta. So it's the same set of constraints that we had um, from Selberg's functions. Uh, okay, so we can actually uh, construct these things explicitly. Here's what they look like for Fourier transform supported in minus one one. So this blue function is that arctangent function we want to approximate, and the pink function is our measurement. And the minor int is going to be, I guess, the anti-symmetric of that, right? The bump will come like that. But okay. So the minor int is the same as the major int with a certain variable change. Uh, right. So um, these are constructed from uh, what's now called the berlin selberg extremal problem. So given a function uh, f from r to r, can we find entire functions whose Fourier transforms are compactly supported? That's the same as saying they have finite exponential type. Um, and we want them to either be bigger than the function we're choosing or smaller, and we want to minimize this integral. So that's exactly what Selberg did for the characteristic function of the interval. That's what we needed to do for this kind of crazy arctangent function that arose. Uh, so this pro uh, problem has a, a long history, and if you're going to tie it to physics, the history is in signal processing. But I don't know anything about that, so I'm not going to say anything more than a lot of electrical engineers work on this stuff. Um, so here's some results. So this was studied back in the 70s by uh, Selberg and signal processing people. Uh, and then uh, Graham and Valor picked it up in the 1980s. And then more recently, Emmanuel Carniero, Frederick Lippmann, and Jeff Valor revisited these problems. Um, so the way, or at least the approach of Valor and his co-authors took is um, you get these sort of uh, one way to think of them is density functions that generate classes of other functions. I'll show you how to do that in a second. Um, and most of the work uh, was on even functions until very recently, Carnier and Lippmann with an odd function, which is what we needed for S of t. So the theory wasn't really in place until recently to do this stuff. Um, as an aside, I just found out this morning that uh, as a mathematician, this guy's name is Ben Logan. And as a blue glass musician, his name is Tex Logan. And there's a New York Times article that says, mathematician by nay, day, bluegrass legend by night, anyway. <laughs> uh, so I don't, I don't know if anyone's a bluegrass fan, but that's Tex Logan. Um, okay. He passed away a month ago, yeah. So yeah, but I think there's YouTube clips of him playing the fiddle. Uh, I didn't watch them yet. Um, OK, so uh, I said that, that these are um, sort of integral kernels. So um, Carniero, Lippmann, Valor, all these papers that had these integral kernels, uh, they, ba they basically show you can solve the berlin selberg extremal problem if you can uh, write your function as this integral kernel times a measure which is finite and non-negative. You still have to work out all the properties of the functions you get from this, but you know that your solution will be optimal. Uh, OK, so here's this arctangent function that we have. Uh, it's odd, so basically the only choice we have was to use this Carniero-Lippmann result. So uh, the problem really, the, well, the first step in solving this was to, to find this measure. So uh, I mean, probably the most obvious choice is this one. OK, anyway. <laughs> now you have to verify that that's finite and not negative. I guess Brian Conry probably is the kind of formula you like, right? <laughs> uh, OK. Um, in keeping in theme of the conference, you want to generalize this to um, other L functions and to families. So uh, studying the S of T uh, for Dirichlet L functions goes back to a paper of Selberg from 1946. Uh, he showed S of T chi. This is the analytic of Littlewood's results. So it's uniform in um, Q and T. He also averaged S of T over um, characters in a family. He showed that it's bounded on average. So uh, you can uh, do the same sort of thing in our approach. And you get the same one quarter log QT, right? So it's just replacing his big O by the one quarter. You can bound the order of vanishing using this. Uh, so unfortunately, he gets this unconditionally. We get it on GRH, but we get a nice constant there. 
uh, and you can do the same thing for uh, general L functions um, with functional equation and Euler product. If you want to count things in analytic conductor aspect, uh, Ramanujan Peterson comes into play. So you get so right. So if you know Ramanujan Peterson, you can take this data to be zero. Otherwise, you take it to be whatever we know. Uh, in general, for automorphic L functions, that's a half, my, a little bit less than a half. Um, but if you want to count, so this is essentially counting low lying zeros of L functions. Kind of magically, if you want to count high zeros, it goes away. Um, so if you're looking at a degree m L function, the, the, in T aspect, the conductor is T to the m, right? So you get the same one quarter appearing. Um, but the implied constant depends on all the other properties of your L function, so it's sort of hidden in the little o of one. Um, but the Ramanujan Peterson thing goes away for high zeros. Um, okay. Uh, right, so. How am I doing on time? Okay, I think. So uh, similar ideas can be used to study uh, the pair correlation, the zeros of the zeta function. So if you've been paying attention, I guess, for the last two weeks, you get the same kind of strength, constraints from Montgomery's theorem. You get functions that are supported in minus 1, 1. So you're automatically looking at a class of functions of finite exponential type, right, whose Fourier transforms are compactly supported. And so, um, I guess these ideas were what Montgomery and Taylor and Gallagher uh, studied um, in the 70s and 80s. Um, OK, so the setup we've seen a few times over the course of this conference. Um, right, so uh, the number of zeros up to height t, I said, is t log t over 2 pi. So um, the, the average spacing up to height t is 2 pi over log t. Um, so Montgomery introduced his pair correlation function. You want to you're summing over two sets of zeros. You want to count the number of pairs that are less than beta times the average spacing. Um, and so I'm going to call this function nt beta. So this is the number of pairs of zeta, or the number of pairs of zeta zeros less than beta times the average spacing. Um, and he made this conjecture that we've seen a number of times that this quantity here should be asymptotic to n of t times uh, this integral. Right? So this is the pair correlation function. And uh, Dyson observed that eigenvalues from the Gaussian unitary ensemble have the same pair correlation function. So this was laid out uh, very nicely in the mini courses last week. Um, so we're going to do something a little strange, I guess. Um, following Gallagher, uh, think of this function as a function of beta and kind of expand it asymptotically. So um, a little bit of fiddling with the um, series expansion of this thing. You get a leading order term of beta minus a half plus 1 over 2 pi beta squared plus an error term. So, um, so if you do that, um, so here's, if you want to think of Montgomery's pair correlation uh, conjecture uh, written this way, um, you can use the same sort of ideas to get uh, upper and lower bounds for the number of pairs of, of zeta zeros that are um, less than uh, beta times the average spacing. We get an upper bound. That's sort of too big by a half, and we get a lower bound that's too small by a half. Um, and we can get this. Uh, we can actually write down a continuous function here. It's just hard to look at. It's easier to think about it just looking at the first few terms of the expansion. Um, and we can get it for all beta. So uh, back in the 80s, Gallagher did this uh, in a discrete set of points when beta was an integer or a half integer. Uh, and I'll explain why he did it that way in a second. Um, right. So. Uh, where does this come from? So it comes from Montgomery's theorem, which again we saw uh, a number of times uh, last week. If you sum over two sets of zeros against a test function r, Montgomery evaluated this as r of zero times this pair correlation kernel, uh, so long as the support of r is in, of Fourier transform of r is in minus one one, and this uh, weight function is sort of uh, from the version of the explicit formula Montgomery uses. For most applications, that doesn't matter too much. Um, OK, so well, let's just play the game of what if we could just plug in the characteristic function of an interval into the sum over two sets of zeros? Well, you'd get a diagonal contribution from whenever a gamma equal to gamma prime. And that would give you sort of a sum over the multiplicities of the zeros. And then um, what else would you get? Well, you need gamma minus gamma would have to be between 0 and beta, or it would have to be between minus beta and 0. So that says there's a pair of zeros less than beta times the average spacing. 
and you'll get one in the zero to beta interval, and you'll get one in the minus beta to zero interval. So you get two times Montgomery's pair correlation function. So uh, to Gallagher, anyways, that said, OK, let's plug in something that approximates as close as possible the characteristic function of an interval here. Then you can get an estimate for this thing. Uh, so that's uh, precisely what uh, Gallagher and then later my collaborators and I did. So uh, right, we want uh, this looks just like the previous problem with a big caveat. Um, we want uh, functions which are either bigger than or smaller than the characteristic function of the interval. Fourier transforms compactly supported. But now uh, we want to minimize this integral. And so we've changed from Lebesgue measure uh, to uh, this kind of measure from the pair correlation. So, um, so Selberg's uh, functions certainly satisfy this requirement in this one, uh, but they don't necessarily minimize that thing. Uh, OK, so um, plug it in, and we can evaluate that integral. And you get this thing, which is a continuous function. I again said it's hard to look at, so just keep the first few terms is what we did in the statement of the theorem. And we recover Gallagher's bounds. Um, it's actually quite delicate to do this in general. Um, so the point being, uh, we need to use expansions of Selberg's function and its Fourier transform. And when beta is not an integer or half integer, these are infinite series, and there's some delicate convergence issues. Uh, when, beta, when beta is an integer or half integer, all the series are finite. And this is what Gallagher did. And then there's no problem interchanging integrals and sums, and everything just pops out really easily. So uh, probably Gallagher could have proved this. I think uh, it was a lot of work, so I see why he didn't. Um, OK. Uh, right, so um, we didn't stop there. We said, well, these, this is nice. We get a nice theorem. It generalizes Gallagher's result, but uh, it's not optimal. Right? Um, oh, anyway, so our functions are continuous, so you can plot them. So. In black, this is Montgomery's pair correlation function. This is our upper and lower bound. Now, uh, trivially, the lower bound is 0. So we don't get a non-trivial contribution to about 0.8. Uh, but our proof does show that there's lots of small gaps between 0 and the zeta function. Because this is giving you a lower bound for the number of things less than beta times the average spacing. So we get something about gaps between 0 starting here on the lower end. Um, and if you zoom out, everything looks linear, because remember, the, Fourier expan or the expansion started as beta minus a half plus terms tending to 0. So it just looks like three lines after a while. Yeah. Um, right, so uh, uh, the correct extremal problem um, uh, is probably the following. Right, we want to minimize uh, a major int or minor in the characteristic function in the interval against uh, this different kind of measure. Um, and we want the um, support of the Fourier transform to be in minus 1, uh, 1. Um, and uh, with um, Carnero, Chandy, and Lippmann, uh, uh, we actually construct these functions um, using, well, it's no longer a Fourier analysis problem. It ends up being um, a Hilbert space problem. We use de Branche's theory of entire functions to do this. Um, the problem is, is, so far as we can tell, it's not particularly usable in Montgomery's theorem. So uh, the functions can be constructed explicitly. We do this in our paper. But um, the form that we get of them is over the set of zeros, so from these functions that come from de Branche's theory. And uh, um, these are conceivably transcendental functions, and it's hard to know where their zeros are. So we have the functions written in terms of sums of zeros of other functions. So um, when this is Lebesgue measure, the two functions you get from de Branche theory are cosine pi x and sine pi x. And their roots are at the integers and the half integers, and everything kind of falls out. So uh, in some way, you can think of de Branche's theory of entire functions as some kind of generalization of Fourier analysis. So it generalizes cosine pi x and sine pi x to other entire functions. Maybe that's a naive way of looking at it. Um, OK, so we can't really say. Uh, we can't really improve Gallagher's inequality uh, using these functions, but what can we say? Um, uh, well, let me show you how, to, how a different kind of extremal problem that arises that actually kind of says something I find to be interesting. So I'm going to say PW for the classical Paley Wiener space. So these are um, functions of finite exponential type that converge L2. And then I'm going to say PW pair correlation for the ones that 
do the same thing, but with this pair correlation measure. So there, um, Fourier transforms for to minus a half half, um, and uh, the integral against the pair correlation measure is finite. And um, there's an equivalence in norms between these two spaces. Um, so uh, right, so f is in um, this space if and only if it's in this space, and we have an equivalence in norms. So why? Um, it's the uncertainty principle from uh, Fourier analysis, Fourier transform. So, um, so this one is obvious. So this measure is always less than or equal to one. So this integral is always less than or equal to that one. So that's a, an obvious inequality. So the thing to prove is this one. So think about how it would fail. So how could a, um, how could you make this norm really, really small? Uh, well, this uh, measure is uh, a zero near zero, right? So you would want to choose a function f whose, whose mass was supported near zero. Uh, but the uncertainty principle for the Fourier transform says that can't happen because the Fourier transform is supported near zero. So um, you can prove this constant. I think we can prove it with an eighth without very much work. So um, anyway, uh, so what do we glean? Uh, well, Paley Wiener space is a Hilbert space. And so, so is this pair correlation space. And its norm is given by this. Um, the um, the functional f goes to well evaluation homomorphism is um, continuous in the Paley-Wiener space, so it's continuous in this space. Uh, so if you use the Reese representation theorem, there has to be a function that gives you evaluation at w. Uh, we call this uh, a reproducing kernel. So it makes this pair correlation space a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. Um, right. So the natural question is, what is this? Um, so maybe non-analytic number theorists avert your eyes, right? So it's this thing. Um, okay, we can write it down explicitly. Um, I didn't think I'd have enough time to show you how to solve an extremal problem, so I cut out the slides. But okay, slightly ahead of schedule. But okay, uh, once you have this thing in tow, um, uh, there's a kind of a classical theory that makes it pretty easy to solve extremal problems if you know explicitly what the reproducing kernel is, and we do in this setting. So we were able to solve a whole slew of approximations. Um, in particular, we can recover Montgomery and Taylor's result on simple zeros. Uh, we're also able to solve um, the following extremal problem. So uh, suppose we called it the two delta extremal problem. So imagine you have two delta spikes, one at beta and one at minus beta. So you have a function that's one at beta and one at minus beta and zero everywhere else. And we want to know what's the optimal non-negative function that goes over those. Um, and so using the reproducing kernel, um, uh, we can find it. And we can show that it's actually the difference between the Selberg majorant in this context and the Selberg minorant in this context. Um, and so uh, though we can't use uh, de Branche theory to get uh, a hold of this function and this function very nicely, what we can do is use de Branche theory to get a hold of their difference, which is kind of interesting. Um, and so if you think of your upper bound for pair correlation and your lower bound, we can get a nice bound for the difference between the upper and the lower bound. And we can write it explicitly in terms of this reproducing kernel that was on that awful slide. Um, and if you uh, expand this out uh, as a series, uh, you can see that it's um, not analytic, because you get absolute value of a sine function. Right? It doesn't have a Laurent series. Um, uh, anyway. Um, so uh, one way we like to think of this, um, though other people have objected to this viewpoint, um, it measures how far away we are from knowing Montgomery's pair correlation is true. So if, if Montgomery's pair correlation was a theorem, uh, the upper bound for this quantity would be 0, right? Because it would be the, we would know the asymptotic. So uh, we don't know that, but we can sort of plot uh, as a function of beta how far away you are from improving it, right? So the upper and lower bound are quite close when beta is small. And they kind of grow as, um, as beta gets larger. So uh, in, in this weird interpretation, we're close to solving Montgomery's pair correlation for small beta, and we're far away from large beta, <laughs> if, if you take that viewpoint. Others have objected to me when I've said that. Um, so I guess I do have uh, a couple minutes left. So um, going back to the first part of the talk with S of t, uh, this, this is something that was talked about uh, a lot last week and a little bit on Monday in Brian and Steve's talk. This is the 1 versus 2 problem for S of t. 
Um, so I showed you, you know, Littlewood got this bound, and we got a nice constant in there. Uh, and so uh, this is the analog of the two problem um, for S of t. The, um, the one was proved by Montgomery that, that you get as big as root log t over log log t. So if you remember on the one line for the zeta function, you can prove that values get big unconditionally, and then conditionally on our h, you can show they get no bigger than twice that. And so the one versus two was in the constant of, of what you're evaluating here. Uh, it comes essentially in your power of log t. Um, but it's the same phenomena. It's essentially how many primes can you control in any kind of approximation to the zeta function. Um, OK, so, uh, so I, I guess uh, Montgomery conjectures in his original paper that this should be the answer. Um, recently, with random matrix models, um, David Farmer, Steve Gonick, and Chris Hughes, two of whom are in the audience, um, conjectured it should be 1 plus a little bit. I guess it's a 1 plus a something. So it's almost, almost Montgomery's result. It's, uh, it differs by a log log. The log log jumps up to the numerator. Uh, OK, so maybe this is the correct analog of 1. I was thinking a bit about why you don't see that on the one line, but I think you do. I think the log log is a lower order term, probably. So I think it is the correct analog. This is a correct one analog of the one line problem. Um, so uh, I recently, um, I was thinking about this. So on the one line, everyone's very careful to prove estimates with constants. Uh, but on the half line, they just throw big O's and omegas everywhere. So we got a nice sharp constant here. So the question is, what can you get here? Uh, Montgomery's original paper, um, he can actually compute a constant. He gets a 1 over 20 times pi here. Uh, and so the question is, how close is that to sort of the limit of the methods? Um, I guess in work in progress, Hung Bui and Maxime Redswell and I can uh, sort of improve Montgomery's method by a factor of about 20 uh, using um, the resonance method. But um, it's an, I, we're, I like this theorem. I think my co-authors don't like it because it's a T-aspect theorem. It doesn't generalize to other L functions. It's truly something about T and not analytic conductor. But I think um, this is the limitation of that method for the same reason that Sonderargin's omega theorem for zeta is the limitation. But anyway, I'll uh, end there. Thanks again. Are there any questions for